Thanks very much, Cully. I, um, even my appraiser thought I was spending too much time at men's health meetings and told me 5% was the maximum I should spend on men's health. Don't know what I should spend the rest on. Perhaps you could suggest that to me later. Um, right, always uh, wake people up at this time of day. This isn't what I'm talking about. This is the, the example of the misconception. I'm not talking about anabolic steroid use. I'm talking about restoration of physiological levels. And I'm going to put it to you that actually steroids and PD-5 inhibitors are actually a very nice mix, as we'll get to later. A lot of definitions cause problems here. We, we have terms like uh, andropause, ADEM, PADEM, uh, but I like the term late onset hypogonadism because at least hypogonadism is in the ICD classification. There is a, 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 a move to call it testosterone deficiency, but the two are interchangeable. And the important thing here is that the definition states that it's a combination of abnormal biochemistry with clinical symptoms. And the uh, EAU and, uh, and ISAM uh, have laid down uh, levels of uh, 12 nanomoles per litre above which testosterone is probably normal. Below 8 is uh, definite uh, hypogonadism. And between 8 and 12 is a grey zone where patients can be considered for treatment according to symptoms. And this corresponds to levels of free testosterone at the lower end of 180 and at the upper end of around 225 picomoles per litre. Now, the largest study conducted on the relationship of symptoms to abnormal biochemistry was the European Male Aging Study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. And what this showed conclusively was that the three cardinal symptoms that predicted uh, a low testosterone level were uh, poor morning erections, loss of sexual desire, and erectile dysfunction. And here I, I come across one of the biggest problems, that if ever you send patients to eminent professors of endocrinology, they'll usually send you a letter back saying, I've decided not to treat this patient uh, because he is asymptomatic and I will see him again in 12 months' time. And you write to that professor and you say, well, actually the chap has got no erections at all for the last three years, hasn't been able to have sex, and he's got no libido to which the professor will say, well, I don't deal with those symptoms. So in fact, we've got a situation where the experts in a condition often don't deal with the three commonest symptoms of that condition. And I can't think of any other uh, specialities that's got itself into a mix. Now, having a low testosterone is actually bad news for your cardiovascular system. I could show you any number of studies here. This is the Norfolk study, but there are studies from Seattle, from uh, the Massachusetts male aging study, from California, the Rancho Bernardo, the uh, Tromsko study, uh, a Swedish study, a Pomeranian study. I even had to look where that was on the map. And they all show that having a low testosterone, testosterone is associated with higher cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. And I put it to you, if you went to see your doctor with ED, and he measured your testosterone, and you found out that you were in the lowest tertile, and therefore within eight years you were heading towards this difference in mortality, and you, were, you asked him whether you should be treated, and he said, we're expecting studies to come in in the next 10 years. I think you'd have a difficult decision to make. I certainly would. Uh, some of the studies will come too late for these patients. Uh, even worse, if you're a patient who, uh, who has had a myocardial infarction, this is from Sheffield, where they looked at over 900 patients with established cardiovascular disease, measured their testosterone, and then tried to follow them up for 10 years, and they discovered those with a testosterone equivalent of about 10.4 nanomoles per litre were all dead in 6.9 years. So they're certainly not going to have time to wait for the long-term studies to come up. So if you had a testosterone of 8 or 9 and you'd had a myocardial infarction, perhaps you won't want your doctor to pontificate and wait for the value of long-term studies. Uh, now, what happens as our testosterone levels fall? This was an excellent study from Zitzman 
that showed that even at levels of round about 15 nanomoles per litre, we begin to lose some vitality and some libido. And most of those of you who work in the NHS would say, well, I can't really think that that's particularly important. But as it falls further, you begin to raise your uh, BMI and become overweight a little bit further, and the risk of diabetes, depression, cognitive impairment comes in. I think we've got to be interested in that. And then you begin to get hot flushes and erectile dysfunction. But I'll emphasize that these were a group of men without established cardiovascular disease or diabetes. So clearly, if you have a cardiovascular disease, the erectile dysfunction will come in much earlier than that. Now, testosterone works at numerous sites in the body. We all know, of course, that it works on the brain uh, to enhance libido and stimulate erection, usually by dopamine release. But it also works on the spinal erection center, and it has important effects on the vascular endothelium uh, up, uh, upgrading uh, nitric oxide and enhancing the effects of PDE5 inhibitors uh, both on the endothelium and in the cavernosal smooth muscle. So there's multiple sites at which testosterone works on our sexual function. Now, if you do as I do and you run a, an erectile dysfunction clinic uh, and testosterone is a mandatory investigation for all patients, as Cully told us, uh, you will find that a lot of patients have, po have uh, low levels. And wherever you draw your level, you will discover that there's a different prevalence. Now, the interesting things here is obviously, as the patients age, more and more will be hypogonadal at whichever level you take as being abnormal. But even when in patients in their 20s and 30s, you will see that if we take uh, three nanograms per ml or 10.4, 10.5 nanomoles per litre, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll have about 15 to 20 percent of men uh, with low testosterone levels. And the important thing in this age group is that they probably haven't got significant cardiovascular disease, so that they will probably be treated effectively by testosterone alone. And Nigel Cole there, who work, works with my, my, my clinic in Birmingham, we find numerous men in their 30s or early 40s who've been missed, who've been treated exclusively by psychosexual techniques because it's presumed that as they were young, it must be psychological. And actually, their lives have passed them by because they've got no families, they've had no relationship, and they're often infertile. So that's one of the major reasons for measuring it in everybody. Kalinchenko in Russia looked at a group of patients who'd not responded to Viagra versus those who'd responded and found a highly significant difference in the testosterone levels in the non-responders, which was then the basis of the studies uh, that, that, uh, that uh, looked at uh, how we can address this. Inter interesting enough, NICE guidance tells us that we should ask every diabetic patient about rectal dysfunction every year, and we should measure uh, all the relevant tests and offer treatment to all of them. But currently, we're only doing this for about 10% of our diabetic patients in the UK. So what happens if we restore the testosterone level in hypogonadal uh, patients with ED? This was the landmark study by Ridwan Shabzig, where he looked at Viagra non-responders and then introduced Viagra combined with either testosterone gel or placebo gel. And as you can see, there was significant uh, return of erectile function in the treated patients. A more recent study, the TAD test one, used Tadalafil uh, combined with testosterone gel. And they actually used a regime of daily dosing with Tadalafil. And what they found was that it, that it was only significant at levels of 10.4 nanomoles per litre of testosterone or below. So whereas the other one had treated patients up to 14, here it was only significant reversal at lower levels of testosterone. And they found that you had to treat the patients for eight to 10 weeks with the testosterone before the response to PD-5 inhibitor became significant. So the message is restore the testosterone level 
and then reintroduce the PDE5 inhibitor, otherwise the patients will get disappointed. How should we be giving testosterone? Well, this shows that if we use oral testosterone, we have to give it about three times a day, and the levels will swing all over the place and sometimes go above the therapeutic level. Uh, if we choose what our medicines management people might like us to use, which is uh, Sustanon, we'll find that 50% of the time the patients are out of the therapeutic range, and so we probably have to give it at two weekly intervals instead of four weekly intervals. And the problem there is that the patient will, ha will have to have 26 visits to the nurse a year for his injection therapy uh, versus four if he uses a long-acting in injection. And if you look at the economic model, if you as a GP uh, or, or a, a physician can't find better things for your nurse to do in those additional 23 visits, you're not trying very hard. The gel uh, gives us good sustained levels over a 24-hour period and is more effective as if it's administered to multiple sites. And the long-acting testosterone under canoate produces sustained levels over a 10 to 12-week period. We have guidelines from the European Urology Association which confirm these points and point out this uh, 8, 8 to 12, and 12. Uh, but I'd, what I'd highlight here is that we should always be measuring the LH, FSH, and prolactin. And if the LH or FSH are particularly low or the prolactin is above about 900, you should consider referral to an endocrinologist because the, there's an increased risk of this patient having pituitary pathology. Uh, uh, recent studies have looked at the, uh, uh, the impact on sexual function of, of testosterone versus placebo. And this is the uh, Moscow study, which showed that if you actually, uh, that with Nibido against placebo, that you actually get improvement in depression scores, you get marked improvement in the aging male symptom scores, and you get significant improvement in erectile function when you normalize the testosterone level. The largest study on the long-acting Nibido was re has recently been presented in Vienna, which is the IPAS study, which has over uh, 1,100 patients, uh, and what that showed is that if you looked at the level of sexual desire, there were tremendous improvements from baseline versus the fifth injection at about nine months to, to a year, where you'll see that here um, there were 64% of patients with very low levels of sexual desire and only 10% uh, by the end of the, uh, end of the treatment period. Uh, and uh, if you then went on to look at mood, likewise, whereas uh, 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 about 36% of patients had very negative or negative mood, uh, only 5% had those. And, and uh, those of you who are urologists, I think, would rather have your, the mood level of your, uh, of your registrars in the higher range rather than the lower if you were getting good work levels out of them. Uh, if we look at the uh, severity of the erectile dysfunction, as you can see, see here, at baseline, 65% had moderately severe or extremely severe erectile dysfunction, and only 19% at the end. Uh, and they had greater responses to PDE5 inhibitors, as you can see here, uh, whereas 35% uh, 30, uh, 35 only had good response to a PD-5 inhibitor at baseline. That had gone up to 57% by the end. Most strikingly, though, was in that group, there were a number of diabetic patients. And what was found was that the HbA1c improved by 0.3% overall. And in the poorly controlled ones with a, an HbA1c of over 79 there was a more than 1% improvement in HbA1c. And for those of you who know uh, uh, the, the long-term data from diabetes studies, that corresponds to about a 23% reduction in cardiovascular risk. So that's pretty, pretty important. Now, recent studies have looked at wh what happens if you, if you look at these survival curves and you treat patients with testosterone. This is uh, a study presented by Hugh Jones at the, uh, the ENDO meeting earlier this year. And they'd been following up 
uh, uh, patients for over 10 years. And as you can see here, th this is the, uh, the, the uh, patient with low testosterone untreated, and these are the patients with normal testosterone, and these were the ones who were low but being treated. And they've restored the mortality rate to the patients who had normal testosterone at baseline. A similar study uh, from Molly Shores in Seattle has done exactly the same thing but with a larger number, and they found that the treated patients had half the cumulative mortality than the untreated ones, and that the effect was particularly important in men aged 40 to 60 and in men with diabetes. Now, uh, for the urologists in, in, in the group, this is a, a study that uh, was published uh, earlier this year that actually showed that looking at uh, 194 new cases of prostate cancer and 317 age match controls, that the prostate cancer group um, uh, had um, lower levels of testosterone than the control group. And good news for all of us, I think if you get one take-home message from today, this is it. The more sex you had, the less likely you were to get prostate cancer. And just like the Caffili cohort study, it's that third episode of sexual activity per week that significantly reduces your risk of prostate cancer. So that's got to be the take-home message for all of us. Um, from the IPAS study, uh, for those of you who are worried about PSA, as you can see, this was the baseline, a slight raise by visit three, and then the PSA falls back to normal by visit five. Uh, slight changes in the hematocrit, but no patients got above the 54 uh, cutoff point where you might be concerned. Um, one urine retention, no cases of prostate cancer in the entire study, 1,100 patient years, 6,300 injections. And if we look at some of these studies being done in high-risk groups, this is patients with, uh, with PIN, uh, with intrathelial ne uh, neoplasia. As you can see here, uh, these are the patients uh, before testosterone and after testosterone, and there was no difference between the two groups in the PSA uh, in patients with PIN as compared with a, a control group. And in high-risk groups of patients who've had uh, successful treatment for prostate cancer, uh, these combined studies here have shown that uh, there was no uh, uh, significant change in, in PSA in the treated group, even though their testosterones rose quite significantly with testosterone therapy. And Abe Morgenthaler has recently published another series uh, which is in, uh, extremely reassuring about this. Ridwan Shabsik published a meta-analysis of 197 papers and concluded no increase in cases of prostate cancer with testosterone therapy. Uh, this is an interesting uh, follow-on of patients on testosterone therapy, which suggests that your biggest risk is having too many prostate biopsies, because here we see uh, that you are 20 times more likely to have a prostate biopsy if you're on testosterone, and no more likely that those 20 times the number of biopsies would detect a prostate cancer. You would have expected by chance that the more biopsies you did, the more that you would find. So what do the guidelines say? The guidelines say that really, at present time, there's no cause for concern, there's no conclusive evidence that prostate cancer increase, uh, testosterone therapy increases the risk of prostate cancer, but some would say that's not evidence of safety. Uh, we need longer studies, but as I'd like to, as I think I've shown you, all the studies coming through are extremely reassuring. Uh, also with LUTs, there's evidence that uh, as you treat uh, patients with testosterone, the LUTs actually improves rather than gets worse. Uh, and uh, I just leave you with the uh, European uh, uh, EAU guidelines on erectile dysfunction, which, which actually says uh, uh, there's no, although some data suggest that testosterone administration does not cause prostate cancer, it is currently contraindicated in men with a history of prostate cancer or with symptoms of prostatism. Nice to see that old term coming back into, 
into the folklore, uh, which is, of course, a little bit ir irrational and not really evidence-based. Now, Cully touched on the point that in the uh, US, there's much more testosterone being used than in the UK. And if you look at the different population sizes, there's the USA, there's the European Union, you can see that in 2009, there was roughly uh, uh, 13 times more testosterone being prescribed in the US, uh, even for this smaller population. So clearly, somebody's got it right and somebody's got it wrong, because it's difficult to reconcile those two views. So this is a quick summary of the rationale uh, for treating testosterone in hypogonadal patients before using a PD-5 inhibitor. The ED improvement will allow for spontaneous sex without taking a tablet. They get improved desire, orgasm, and ejaculation. If you do need to use a PD-5 inhibitor later, it's more likely to be effective. Important to the patient, testosterone is reimbursed in the UK. Patients would expect an abnormality to be found rather than being symptomatic treatment. There are other potential health benefits, metabolic, osteoporosis, depression, but they can only make the right decision if we ask the right questions and do the right investigations, which I find sometimes very frustrating. But I have, I have this picture above my desk that when I get frustrated, at least somebody's got a worse job than I have working in the NHS. Thank you very much.